Chapter 8, Before Darkness Please, please do not do this to me. Lord Melbourne supplicated, in a pitiful tone, feeling that tears must flow down his cheeks, but strangely at the same time he felt as if he had no corporeal form, as though he had no body within that space in darkness. I have not done anything to William, no one has done anything to you. Each person is responsible for their destiny, that destiny that builds with their actions and omissions. No one has brought you here, William, you have reached this point yourself. Every person in the world has a single opportunity in every earthly life to do things one way or another, no one has a second chance to change what he has done in an earthly life. Second chances, to go back in time and correct the wrong course you took at a particular point in your life trajectory, do not exist. If no one has a second chance to correct their past life, why should you have it? What makes you different from other humans to have a second chance? Connor said thoughtfully and at the same time compassionate. But I cannot lose her. I cannot lose her a second time. Exclaimed Lord Melbourne in despair. William, losing a being you love in life is only a matter of time, and many times, unfortunately, it does not depend on your will. But other times it's up to you, your decisions, what you do or stop doing at a crossroads of your life. That is why I have told you that you should reflect on your experiences, about your past and present. In your hands have always been the threads, always, replied Connor earnestly. But it's not fair. Bring me here to make me believe in a second chance and now take it from me. Victoria needs me, I cannot abandon her. Lord Melbourne cried in a broken voice, I cannot leave her alone with a baby. She will not be able to get ahead alone. William, if I told you that all this experience has been a dream, an illusion, that you should not worry about leaving a Victoria pregnant, inexperienced, and helpless, because she does not exist, because the reality you have lived no longer exists, like a dream when you wake up. That will cause you pain, but at least you will have the consolation of not leaving the woman you love with a child in her belly abandoned. But you know how your life could have been with Victoria. How immensely happy you could have been with her, Connor said with a certain coolness and expressionless expression. It was real. Damn, what I lived with Victoria was real. You cannot tell me it was not real. Lord Melbourne protested, feeling the greatest pain in his heart. William, I do not want to cause you pain, but you must see reality, Connor said earnestly. Give me back to that dream, to that fantasy. Lord Melbourne asked. I cannot, even if I wanted to, Connor replied with some sympathy. Damn it! Damn it all, my country, the crown, God, you! Why do you punish me like that? Why? cried Lord Melbourne with infinite rage and pain. William, that anger and pain are the true expression of the love you feel for Victoria. If you had let your feelings guide your way and left aside the fear and prejudices, you would not leave the world in this way, and your death would not be the anteroom to hell. Now you only take with you the learning of our experience in that fictional reality, and the sad lessons of your real life. I hope it serves you, because death is not the end, Connor said as the judge pronouncing a sentence. Lord Melbourne wanted to run, escape, scream, beat Connor but nothing could do, because he felt that he no longer had a voice, felt as if he were dissolving, as if he were fading, as in the worst nightmare. But Connor was still ahead of him. William Lamb, 2nd Viscount Melbourne, in the name of the heavens summoned you before the court of destiny, of your destiny. It's time you faced the end of the path you made in life, Connor said solemnly. Connor became a mass of light that began to reduce to a small point that compressed and then burst into a blinding blast of light. Then Lord Melbourne felt as if he would fall, as if under of his feet, where them should be, a hole would have been opened and he began to plummet. As a flurry of images of his life passed quickly in front of his vision and the last image was that of Victoria, then he saw the darkness hovering over him and as above him a kind of opening of light was moving away in what looked like a firmament of intense black. As he moved away from that opening, he felt as if he were moving away from what he loved most in life, and as if he were sinking into a sea of pain and loneliness. 
until the opening became so distant that it became a tiny point and eventually disappeared, and then the darkness covered him and absorbed him with his mortal embrace, and desperate and terrified felt it melt with her. For a moment it was all darkness, a terrifying darkness, and then he felt as if he had a body shape again, a body of flesh and bone, but at the same time he felt as if he were drowning, as if he lacked air, as if he was dying of suffocation. Desperate, he opened his eyes and began to wave his arms, gasping for air. With one hand he clung to something solid and with the other hand he accidentally pushed another object that fell to the ground and burst into pieces, and turned out to be a glass. Lord Melbourne threw his torso forward and almost screamed, then he totally regained consciousness and realized he was sitting. He was sitting in an armchair, his favorite armchair in his library at Brockett Hall. His heart was pounding and his breathing was agitated and choppy, but slowly he calmed down. He recognized the surroundings, realized that he was in the library at Brockett Hall, and nervously stood up. Lord Melbourne saw one side and the other, looking for Connor, but did not see him. Then he went to the desk and saw a newspaper over it, anxiously picked up the newspaper, and seeing the date, his heart quickened again. His anxiety increased when underneath the headline date of the newspaper, saw a headline of an opinion piece severely criticizing the economic policy of Prime Minister Lord Melbourne's government. Lord Melbourne felt a little dizzy, but made an effort to control himself. He went to the door of the library and opened it, and peering out into the corridor he began to shout to the servants. It was not long before a servant came running to attend to his employer's wishes. What date is it today? Tell me the day, the month, and the year," demanded Lord Melbourne in an impatient tone. The servant's perplexity was enormous at the question of his master, but he was quick to respond intimidated for Lord Melbourne's gesture and tone. The employee mentioned an autumn date of 1839. Lord Melbourne paled at the answer, because the date of the previous day was very significant for him. Tell me. Was the Queen here yesterday? asked Lord Melbourne with a tormented gesture on his face and an altered look, almost insane. Yes. Her Majesty was in Brockett Hall yesterday, my lord, the man replied, puzzled and a little frightened by Lord Melbourne's rare attitude. Lord Melbourne clung to the doorframe with one of his large hands, as if to tear it away. Then he saw the servant with determination. Look for the butler and tell him that I want my horse saddled without loss of time. I must leave urgently. Let my footman have one of my pairs of riding boots ready, that he do not worry about my clothes, I do not have time to change clothes, I just need a coat. I'm not going to have breakfast or take a bath either, I have no time to lose Lord Melbourne commanded in an energetic and intimidating tone that allowed no delay. In a few minutes Lord Melbourne was in his bedroom, where he changed his comfortable shoes by riding boots. Then he put on a long dark blue overcoat over his house-worn clothes. It was a clothing very similar to the one he wore the day Victoria surprised him with her unexpected visit to Dover House, a garment that could look unseemly on an aristocrat outside his home. But at that moment what less interest to Lord Melbourne was his appearance or his decorum. To the surprise of the butler of Brockett Hall and other servants the usually well-groomed and distinguished Lord Melbourne came out the front door with that scruffy appearance. He had not even shaved or combed his hair, his face was like a shop-worn drunken. He even brushed aside one of the hats he used when riding, which his footman offered him. He jumped on his horse and anxiously picked up riding crop that a servant handed him, and took the reins firmly. Then, to the surprise of his staff, he spurred his horse and sped off, heading like lightning down the path leading to the exit of the Brockett Hall property. My God! He's going to kill himself if he ride like that!" exclaimed the boy of the stable. I do not know what happens to Lord Melbourne today, replied the butler, puzzled. Lord Melbourne rode as if he were participating in a race at the racecourse, spurring his horse to keep his pace. He looked like a mad rider, like a cavalryman charging against the enemy in battle. He did not rode in such a reckless way for many years since he was young and stupid. The few people who saw him along the way did not stop wondering what urgency the stranger could have to go so fast. When he entered London, 
he had to slow down and rode more carefully, for the traffic. But in his desperate impatience, whenever he could he would spur his horse again and carry it as quickly as possible through the streets of the British capital. As he approached Buckingham Palace, Lord Melbourne saw the opportunity to rush again and he took advantage of that, feeling his heart beating again with anxiety. The passers-by who, at that early hour were in the vicinity of the palace were surprised to see the horse rider running toward Buckingham, and some who recognised the rider as Lord Melbourne were even more astonished. When Ryder and his horse were already near the gate of the palace, the soldiers on guard prepared their rifles alarmed by the approach to the race of the man. But Lord Melbourne restrained the horse and approached more slowly. He's the Prime Minister, said one of the soldiers, relaxing a little, but still amazed. Lord Melbourne greeted them and they let him pass. At the main entrance of the palace he dismounted from the horse and handed the reins to a stab lemon, whom he quickly ordered to feed and refresh the horse, for the poor animal was exhausted and thirsty for the race. Lord Melbourne entered the palace and without delay asked to first employee that came to pass to him to announce his presence to the Queen and notify her that his visit was as a matter of urgency, that a very serious matter that could not wait made that a meeting between them was essential. Lord Melbourne was taken to the room where he used to meet the Queen, to wait for her. Impatient and nervous, Lord Melbourne paced the room, unable to sit or stand still for long. A cluster of contradictory emotions overwhelmed and tormented him, an anguish he could not master corroded his heart. He felt his hands tremble and a chill ran through his body, even though he had come something heated by the effort of the race and nervous tension. Finally he clutched with one of his hands to the fireplace, and ducked his head, trying to calm himself as he turned his back on the door Victoria had to enter. After a while it seemed an eternity but it was relatively brief, a servant opened the door and Victoria entered the room, and the servant closed the door behind her, leaving both, alone. Lord Melbourne, I really did not expect to see you here today. I cannot imagine that serious and urgent matter could bring you so unexpectedly to Buckingham, I hope it is not a terrible thing, said Victoria. Victoria's tone was not affectionate and cheerful, as it used to be when she talked to him. On the contrary, it was distant, cold, and serious, or at least pretended to be. And Lord Melbourne knew perfectly well the reason. Anyway, his heart beat faster when he heard her voice. Slowly he turned to look at her. Victoria was very astonished when she saw him, and the serious expression on her face became one of bewilderment. She accustomed to seeing him always groomed and dressed in an elegant way, now Victoria saw him scruffy, wearing floor-to-house clothes, which also looked as if he had slept with it, as it was, under his coat, without shaving and disheveled. But there was a savage, sensuous, masculine appeal in his disarray, with his pretty open shirt, showing his broad, masculine chest, his unshaven face that added a coarser look, his disheveled hair, to the gesture of his face that was harder than usual. Victoria reminded him of the images of the pirates of romantic novels, the savage and primitive adventurers who made to sigh to the maidens who fell in love with them, the alpha males who awakened the female libido of the young women and the not so young. Lord Melbourne. Has anything happened to you? Victoria asked without being able to avoid some concern in spite of the anger that had with him. Lord Melbourne saw her with an intense and strange look that made Victoria a little nervous, who was also surprised to see that he had wet eyes. Suddenly, Lord Melbourne walked towards her with steady and fast pace, and Victoria in a spontaneous gesture went to raise her arms, but before doing so Lord Melbourne hugged her tightly and held her against his body. Lord Melbourne. Victoria whispered weakly and trembling. Victoria was almost in shock, paralyzed by the infinite surprise. Lord Melbourne, who was too cautious and timid to approach her, that until the day before, the farthest he had come, was to take her hand and retain it in his own hands and caress her, but with her hand covered by a glove, he now dared to embrace her and unite his body with her body in an unseemly gesture with a Queen of Great Britain by a man who was not her husband and not even her fiancé, and the fact that he was her Prime Minister only added scandal to the event. Victoria's heart began to beat rapidly. Forgive me. Forgive me Victoria. 
Lord Melbourne said in a voice that was almost broken by emotion, as he continued to hug her, his big, strong hands caressing Victoria's small back as he brushed Victoria's head with his chin because of the difference in height between them. Victoria's shock increased, for it was the first time that Lord Melbourne did not call her Your Majesty or Ma'am, but he called her by name, colloquially, and was also asking forgiveness in a very personal way. Victoria, there are moments in life when there are no words to express what we feel, and this is one of them. I have no words to say what I mean, said Lord Melbourne, and then put his hands on her shoulders, and pushed her aside a little from him to meet her eyes, for which Victoria had to lift her head, Victoria yesterday when you confessed your feelings to me and you said that you wanted me to be your life companion, and that your heart was mine, and I told you that I could not accept it and that you should preserve it for another, I... I did not say the truth, I did not say what really felt. And I did not do what I really wanted to do. But I did it because at that moment I felt and thought it was the best thing for you and for our country, and I did it because I wanted to protect you, and there is no greater show of love than protecting what so much we love, even if that means making the greatest sacrifice. Victoria's eyes were white and wet, her small body trembled and her heart beat faster and faster. But now I understand that love must also be based on the truth, and that you have a right to know what lives in my heart for you. Because there are truths that should not be carried to the grave, on the contrary, deserve to be shouted at four winds. Because I also understood that the apparently most correct way is not always the suitable one, and that sometimes the sacrifice is not the noblest but a safe shortcut to hell. Now I know there is only one opportunity in life and that it is a crime to waste it, because I have paid a very high price for my mistake, and I know you will pay for it too. That's why Victoria, it's my duty to tell you the truth, and it's your right to know it, said Lord Melbourne, and then he stroked Victoria's cheek with the fingers of one hand, causing her to shudder, Victoria, I love you. I love you. Victoria was startled a little, as if she had been hit by an electric shock, and her face reflected the mixture of emotion and astonishment. Then she began to cry. I love you like I've never loved anyone in my life. I love you more than I ever loved my wife, I love you like I never thought I could love a person in my life. I love you with despair, I love you with tenderness, I love you with desire, with the desire of a man for a woman. You are my queen, and I adore you and serve you as such, but when I see you, I can only see the woman most beautiful, perfect and sweet of the universe. I am not blind, and that is why I also love your defects, your impulsive and reckless character, your little discretion, your outbursts of bad character when they take the opposite of you, but I love you because you are my only reason to live and now I have the certainty that if I lose you, I will die in the midst of the greatest pain. Every moment of the day I think of you Victoria, in your eyes, your lips, your hair, your voice that for me is music. I wake up thinking of you and I sleep thinking about you. I love you my sweet, beautiful and brave Victoria. Why did not you say it yesterday fool? Why you broke my heart? Cried Victoria, crying and pouting like a little girl. Forgive me, I told you I wanted to protect you. Lord Melbourne began to apologize. I love you. I love you too Lord M. That's why I want you to be my companion because my heart is yours. I love you Lord M. Victoria exclaimed, still crying and pouting. Lord Melbourne kissed her lips, gave her a deep, passionate kiss. With his mouth he ate Victoria's small mouth, rubbed his lips with hers, sucked and nibbled on her small lips. He kissed her without letting her breathe, while with closed her eyes, she was give up to her first kiss with ecstasy. He hugged her very hard, almost hurting her, as if he afraid they would be ripped her from his arms, while one of his hands settled on the end of Victoria's back, almost reaching her butt and pressing her to tighten her against him. Lord Melbourne's mouth descended to Victoria's chin and rose again without ceasing to kiss her, and pressed his lips very hard against Victoria's lips, almost rudely. Then slowly he parted his mouth from Victoria's mouth to look at her face, her beautiful blush, her sweet and slightly amused gesture, and her eyes closed. 
Victoria opened her eyes and saw him almost in ecstasy, then she stepped forward and with timidity and awkwardness Victoria kissed him on the lips, her eager to experience that new experience of kissing. Lord Melbourne smirked and then he responded to Victoria's kiss with enthusiasm, with much passion. He pressed his tongue against Victoria's lips, until she opened her mouth and then Lord Melbourne thrust his tongue into her mouth. Victoria shuddered, and after a moment of surprise, she felt more aroused. She felt Lord Melbourne's tongue explore the inside of her mouth, she tasted the bittersweet taste of his breath, still with the residue of the alcohol he had drunk the night before, as they exchanged fluids. With clumsiness she sought to reciprocate him with her own tongue, and both tongues rubbed, as he held her tightly and pushed his head forward, causing her head to retreat a little. Then Lord Melbourne gently nibbled Victoria's lip, and then his mouth came down to kiss and nibble on her neck that lifted her face to see the ceiling. Victoria felt a hard lump in Lord Melbourne's crotch as his body tightened to hers. Suddenly Lord Melbourne pulled away from her, while he held her by the shoulders. Why are you stopping? Victoria asked with naivety and desire. Victoria, in these situations a man is so excited that if he does not stop in time, then he cannot do it, because his body demands to have intimacy with the woman, the kind of intimacy that a decent woman is supposed to she should only have her husband on the bridal bed, Lord Melbourne answered truthfully, but somewhat embarrassed. Victoria's eyes widened, her face turned red as a tomato, and then she ducked her head and could not help but giggle. I see, Victoria said, trying to hide a mischievous grin and how will I know when your body asks you to have that intimacy with me? You will know, my love, there are things I will teach you in due course, said Lord Melbourne amused and excited, meanwhile, come here. Lord Melbourne took her hand, then he sat down in a chair and he had that Victoria sit on his legs, much to her surprise, which she then reacted with laughter, delighted. I have not sat on anyone's legs for many years, Victoria said blushing and happy. Was he more attractive than me? Asked Lord Melbourne mockingly. Moran. It was Baroness Lazen the last person to carry me on her legs, Victoria said with a laugh. What do you think Baroness Lazen would do if she saw us now? Asked Lord Melbourne with sarcasm and mockery. They both laughed. She'd kill you. And she would forget that I am the queen. She would put me face down on her legs and give me a good spanking, Victoria laughed. They talked for a while, and then Lord Melbourne explained in detail the reasons why he had to reject her proposal the day before. Victoria listened intently, her head resting on his shoulder and her hand stroking Lord Melbourne's chest through his open shirt. I understand why you rejected me, but what made you change your mind? Victoria asked in a soft voice. I did not want to lose you for the third time. Lord Melbourne responded with pain, as the painful memories came to his mind. For the third time? Victoria asked in surprise. We have plenty of time for I explain you, in the meantime we must think of the future, Lord Melbourne replied. Lord Melbourne explained his ideas about the strategy that both could use to get approval from the country and the institutions to their marriage ideas inspired by what Connor told him in his conversation at the brothel. And do you think we will succeed? Do you think we will get approval from our marriage? Victoria asked uneasily as she looked up to see Lord Melbourne in the eye. I do not know, Victoria, it's a very risky and uncertain road. What worries me most is that it will endanger your permanence in the throne, but if we do see that the situation reaches such a serious extreme, we must give up. However, I think there are good chances of success, if we play well our cards and convince public opinion, and we get the support of powerful allies, even if that support is not free. In any case, apart from jeopardizing your permanence in the throne you will also have to face your family, all your maternal family will be against you, especially your mother and your uncle Leopold. And you're probably going to have all your paternal family against you too, Lord Melbourne said with concern. I know, Victoria said with some sadness. That's why, if you do not want to risk it and you do not want to break up with your family, I'll understand, and we can forget about all this. 
you are still on time, I will not reproach you, and I will settle for the place you can give me in your life, said Lord Melbourne sincerely. The only place in my life I want for you is my husband. My family has never made me happy, they have never made me feel loved, admired, and understood, you do. The only family I want is the one I would form with you, our children, if God wants us to have them. And as for the country, maybe I'm naive, but with your strategy and fighting the two together I think we can get the necessary approval to our marriage without I lose the crown. What I regret is having to wait so long to I marry you. I'd like to get married today, Victoria said with some dismay in her last words. Me too, Victoria. But patience is essential in big enterprises, he said sympathetically. Lord M. Victoria began. Call me William if you wish, Lord Melbourne replied with a smile. William, Victoria said with a charming, cheerful smile. I wanted to ask you, do you always look like this in the morning? Dirty and scruffy? He replied, amused and embarrassed. No. Handsome and wildly virile, Victoria said and blushed again, you look like a pirate from a romantic novel, strong, brute, bold, savage. They both laughed. Well, maybe the fact of waking up and coming directly here without barely cleaning me, without changing my clothes, and riding like a madman, like a criminal fleeing from the justice that treads his heels, maybe that has something to do. Maybe my smell is not the best right now, he said mockingly. I loved your smell. I thought it was exciting, smell of man, Victoria answered of daring way, her eyes sparkling with desire. Victoria, if we do not get married soon I do not know if I will be able to resist the temptation, said Lord Melbourne, remembering the images of when he made the love with Victoria in that other reality that in the end up being a dream, and soon approached to kiss her again on the lips. The two of them kissed each other again passionately, to unite their tongues in inside of their mouths, rubbing their lips vigorously, while Victoria sat on his lap. Until Lord Melbourne broke the kiss gently. Victoria, I have to go back to Brockett Hall, Lord Melbourne said. No. Why? Victoria protested like a child when they took away her amusement. I have to wash and get dressed, I have to attend to the daily affairs of the government, surely the boxes with the papers that I have to study and solve today must have arrived at Brockett Hall, Lord Melbourne said with a smile on his lips, while he stroked her hair. Send a messenger to Brockett Hall and ask to be sent the documents here, and also your clothes. You can clean and change here in a guest bedroom. And when you finish dispatching the day-to-day -day affairs of the government, we can take advantage of it to hold our working hearings and to advance the pending issues," Victoria said enthusiastically. All right, but you must let me work while I deal with urgent business, Lord Melbourne condescendingly said. Of course. Victoria replied in delight. Victoria, there is something I want to ask you, a nonsense. If one day you and I have a daughter, I want her name's Lizzie, that is, Elizabeth, to be called Lizzie in family, said Lord Melbourne something moved and nostalgic. Elizabeth. Lizzie? It seems a charming name, but why? Victoria asked with a smile, intrigued. I do not know, for a beautiful dream I had, I'll tell you. Lord Melbourne kissed her again and they continued to caress each other and kiss each other with laughter. As the door to the room parted as if it had opened by itself and Victoria's dog, Dash, came in and then the door closed. The dog looked to the side, as if he were seeing someone, in fact beside him was Connor, who was invisible to Victoria and Lord Melbourne, but not to Dash. It seems that your mistress is going to get her way, Dash, you should rejoice for her and thank me in her name. Connor said mockingly and with a smile, but his words could not be heard by Lord Melbourne and Victoria. It was the beginning of a long journey for Lord Melbourne and Victoria, but one thing was certain. Lord Melbourne would never be known as the prisoner of Brockett Hall, and his last dream would be the epiphany that changed his destiny. I hope you all liked this story, I certainly did my best to make it happen. I would like to invite you all to join the Facebook group called For the Love of Vicburn 
founded and run by other writer, Lori Love, in my honest opinion one of the best fanfixes writers of Lord Melbourne and Victoria, author of The Magnificent Revelation, widely recommended. That group brings together a group of fans from Vicburn quite enthusiastic to talk and debate in a pleasant atmosphere about Vicburn, including fanfics. Thank you very much, viewers.